well, I'm very excited that I got to come after you because I think a lot of what you said really feeds into what we're doing at Eastern Carolina Organics. We, um, we're very affected by the California drought, ironically, and um, we really are a social enterprise trying to build solutions to um, problems um, similar to the Newman Zone Foundation. So um, Eastern Carolina Organics, and I made notes because I've never spoken in just 10 minutes, so I'm going to stay on time here. We're a wholesale produce distribution company. Our focus is on locally grown, certified organic fruits and vegetables from family farms throughout North Carolina. We really started with a humble concept. The question was, are people really going to put their money where their mouth was? Are they really going to come out and support local organic farms on a day-to-day -day basis? Was this a hardcore commitment? Or was this going to be a fun event that grocery stores wanted to hang signs about for Earth Day, for example? But we've been around since 2004. We've grown from an experiment to our warehouse that we own now in East Durham, from where we ship products all up and down the East Coast, and we've paid North Carolina farmers over $16 million to date. Our picture of one of our farmers is actually standing in the hallway here. We're really happy to be selling food to the RTP Sheridan, actually. So they're a customer of ours for several years now. Hope you enjoy your meals. Um, we're happy to say that the commitment and the facts around local and organic agriculture are really not a fad. Any given day, I might be dealing with a broken truck on the road or trying to find a home for seven boxes or seven pallets of cabbage, helping a farm transition maybe from conventional peanuts to organic peanuts, or integrating a new farmer into our ownership model. And just like you, any given day, you're probably helping to sharpen a student's confidence for that next test, teaching them to sneeze into their elbows into their, in, into their elbows instead of their hands, perhaps, or preparing them to behave well and open their minds for an upcoming poetry reading, or reminding them to sneeze into their elbows instead of their hands sometimes. So like you, my job is not glamorous every day, but at the end of the day, we're really all trying to do nothing less than save the world, and we should keep that ambition at the forefront every day. Like, um, your efforts are really no joke, and it doesn't matter what segment of education you fall into, I know you're fighting in the trenches every day for it. And similarly, whatever segment of agriculture I fall into, I'm also fighting for it every single day. You can believe in that. Unfortunately, however, as a friend of mine had said, whatever your cause is, it's a lost cause on a dying planet. This is really serious stuff. And it's scary, but it's true. And I'm not going to stand here and say that I'm not concerned about things like pesticides or genetically modified organisms, because I am. But I'm not here because of what I'm against. That I found a long time ago to not be very sustainable or pleasant. I'm here because of what I'm fighting for, and it's for a clean, healthy food supply for all citizens. The positive pressure in this statement right here is that it's unifying for all of us. It should help to remind us all that none of the compartmentalized hard work that we do every day is worth it if we can't remember and integrate the common cause of sustaining a healthy future. From that perspective, we're really partners, and so that's why I'm really happy to be here today. The good news is that there's a lot of reason for hope. There's a great story from Food Corps, which is a really innovative program at public schools around the country, um, from an elementary school in Mississippi is where this picture is taken. And after months of working in the garden and preparing the soil and watering the seeds and keeping the weeds out, the students were finally ready to get in and dig out the fruits of all that hard labor. They were ready to go pluck their radishes out of the ground. And one young boy got down on the ground and on, he was on his hands and knees and as he gently tugs all of this momentous, climactic moment towards his face, it kind of comes right at him and this was his response. I smell Jesus. And we, are, we have tons of these beautiful stories that you will remember more than any other scientific data I can preach to you right now. But it's not just the fun anecdotal stories that we have to show off. There are real programs that are working in real schools, public schools around the country, and especially in North Carolina, I'm proud to say. Some schools realized that they could just be a drop spot for some local organic farmers to come meet families when they would pick up their children to make it easier for families to be going home with fresh fruits and vegetables to prepare for dinner that night. We work with one school customer where a classroom of parents chip in for a box of mixed vegetables to take home each week, but it's the students who are spending an hour every week in their classroom dividing up the money, dividing up the product by the pound or the pint or the cucumber, bagging it all up and even preparing recipes to send home and really sell to their families to prepare for dinner that night. In one, North Car oops, sorry. In one North Carolina district, the sustainability manager designed a food composting program 
In only seven and a half months, the elementary and middle schools have diverted 93 tons of waste from the landfill. It is remarkable, equal to the reduction of carbon from driving 200,000 miles. The schools reduced cafeteria trash from an average total of 155 bags a day down to 18 total bags a day, an 89% reduction. Designed to be cost neutral, they have saved $40,000 on dumpster fees. Who needs to be saving that much money for dumpster fees if you can retain it for other causes? And they're even getting compost back now, fresh, well-tilled soil to put into their school gardens or on the landscaping on the grounds. The most important point of all of these stories is that the children, not just that the children are learning how to take a 45 pound box of squash and divide it up per 22 bags, but they're learning why. They're not just learning how to divide their food waste from landfill waste, but they're understanding why. It's becoming more normative to them, and that's really incredible. That's why we really need to stay hopeful and commit even more to this partnership. By now, it's really well accepted that superior academic performance requires proper nutrition in order to support the health and activity of the nerve cells in our brains. This is especially true for children. I'm sure you all know this on a daily basis. Adequate nutrition ensures that students can fully express their potential for success. And, on, and conversely, research also shows us that children who eat an unhealthy diet of highly processed foods or are simply malnourished tend to have lower test scores and more behavior problems. New research comes out all the time to help us understand these patterns. And there's a lot of evidence pinpointing the impacts of pesticides and other chemicals on childhood um, neurodevelopment and behavioral disorders. Some examples include that the levels of, for example, vitamin C in organic tomatoes are 50% higher than in con conventional tomatoes. Um, various pesticides have been linked with illness to illnesses from allergies to depression to Parkinson's disease. So we're watching studies all the time come out. But the simple truth is that we need to make clean, fresh fruits and vegetables more accessible to all children. And that's my job, and that's your job. Remember, we're partners. The average age of the American farmer is currently 58.3. The lack of young farmers coming into agriculture means that this figure creeps constantly towards retirement at a very fast pace. This is important for many issues like food security, including the drought in California, um, land stewardship, and preserving farming as a cultural way of life that we all really tend to appreciate. Even if we're driving to the beach, we like driving by farmland usually. At Eco, sustainability doesn't just mean the product that we sell, but the relationships that we have and the way we operate internally on a daily basis. It really means constantly looking at stimulus within and outside of our environment and trying to respond to it. To us, that meant that when we turned 10 years old, we conducted a study to see if we were following that same trajectory of the average age, or if our farmers tended to be slightly younger. I'm really happy to say that from 2004 to 2013, we learned that our farmers were not only significantly younger, but our trend, in fact, was decreasing. We went from 53 down to 48 during that time. And in fact, the farmer's face outside of there, his, his next generation is on the farm. We don't really want to just know this is not them. That we don't want to just know that, this, that we have young farmers in the, our family. That's nice. We can pat ourselves on the back for it. But what's really important is are our current farmers going to tell their children, stay on the farm. This is a good way of life. You can take care of your family with this living. That's really important. Is this a dignified profession that feels secure to people? We had the acting commissioner of the USDA visit us about a year ago to tour our warehouse. And he said, well, when I grew up, my parents said to me around the dinner table on a weekly basis, son, if you work really hard and you do well in school, you also can grow up to become a farmer. And we kind of had this lament, you know, we lamented this mournful moment that that's really not happening as much these days. There's a massive generational gap in that kind of a conversation. It's very uncommon for, pe for kids to be hearing that. At ECO, we're not only committed to making sure that kids want to eat fresh fruits and vegetables, but also that we're part of a trend of kids wanting to grow fresh fruits and vegetables. Be leery of the posters in your supermarket with the fresh and shiny farmers' faces looking very young and very happy and not at all overworked and exhausted and underpaid. But with an educated consumer base that knows not to be greenwashed, I really am happy to see these celebrity farmers' faces up there in the stores because I think we really can usher in a renewed era 
of respect and stability for farmers, and especially produce farmers, vegetable farmers. Now, who can think of this iconic fresh vegetable, fresh fruit, this item that's just about to hit for seasons, that, that crop that you know off-season, imported, could never compete with the flavor that you could get from a fresh farm nearby? It's the strawberry. I knew you all knew it. It's not just around this time of year that I like to talk about strawberries, but um, because if there's one thing I could push along in the sustainable agriculture movement, it's what I would call food mindfulness. This has a lot of hope for us in terms of health and well-being as well. You can make jelly or a salad or a soup or a pie with strawberries, but really what we all like to do is shovel them down, right? Let's make sure you know what goes into this one bite wonder. This is farmers after planting them in the fall, covering them up with some frost protection. A lot of hard work right there. Next, in the winter, they have to run tons of water, not to protect and keep that plant um, hydrated, but because of that precious pocket of warmer air between the ice and the, f and the um, plants themselves. This is really critical, and farmers literally stay up all night keeping these irrigation heads from freezing just to maintain this frost protection for through the winter. This is pretty much what the crop looks like right now. It's a little late in the season. And all of those flower buds will turn into berries. Um, the most important thing is that we really need to be savoring life more, and we need to be enjoying our food more. Michael Pollan, a food writer, has said, pay more, eat less. I know it's very simplified comment, but it's really something that anyone can take to heart in terms of moving the sustainable agriculture movement along a little bit further and integrating it more into any other scientific process that you're advocating for in the classroom. Um, this, this is my closing slide, um, is a post that we put up on Facebook recently after a really long and hard winter this year. And it says, when you grow food or eat based on what's available from your sustainable food shed, you cultivate patience. And we invited some other people to suggest an alternate word for patience. And some people wrote in freedom, tradition, resilience, pride, and tolerance for something that's less than ideal. Who wouldn't want to imbue some of these virtues on our next generation? Thanks.